This is our uh, last session for the day, uh, an interesting session. Uh, it's called What Makes Us Human? Technology, Arts and the Human-Dehuman Divide. The studio and the lab are merging. Emerging technologies such as three-dimensional printing are able to produce artworks and prosthetic teeth using plastic, glass and steel. Meanwhile, artificial intelligence experts are discussing the singularity, the moment where humans and machines merge. Some argue that this process is already underway with cochlear implants and pacemakers signalling the start of a new phase in human development. So how can we conceptualise the human-dehuman divide without images from science fiction filling the void? Your chair for this session is Rose Hiscock. She's the Executive Director of Arts Development, the Arts Council, uh, Australia Council for the Arts, beg your pardon. Rose is responsible for building national and international audiences and markets for Australian arts. Her career spans both commercial and cultural sections. Uh, that means that she may be part of Hogwarts and the other group, maybe. Um, she has worked in audience development, strategic marketing, and building and communicating cultural brands. Prior to working for the Australia Council, Rose led Museum Victoria's marketing and commercial uh, operations where she was responsible for considerable commercial growth as well as significant campaigns such as the successful Melbourne Winter Masterpieces exhibition. Please welcome Rose. Thank you, everyone. I'm hoping this will be a very lively session. And we started our day with Senator Brandis uh, talking about the past. Well, we're going to be talking about the future in this session, uh, with, a, with, a, with reference to the past, of course. Um, now, I'd particularly like to welcome the lads from uh, Canberra Grammar. Um, just talking b before to a couple of you guys, um, I understand you're doing your IB this year, and you are writing an essay, a significant essay, and looking for uh, uh, intellectual fodder. So <laughs> hopefully uh, this session will, will help develop that. Um, but I'd really encourage you guys to be vocal in this session. Um, if you've, if we're talking about the future. We're talking about your world as well as ours. So if, if you've got ideas and want to throw in, uh, there'll definitely be time, time towards the end to do that. So I'd absolutely encourage that. Um, the, just a, a, a minute on the Australia Council. Um, we are the uh, federal government's arts funding body, and we fund um, both. Um, we fund the arts, and that that are the things you may think of, such as orchestras, um, visual arts, performing arts, arts organisations. But we're also more and more funding. Um, hybrid arts practice, so arts that are working in the uh, digital space, in virtual reality, in um, hybrid arts, in cross arts, in new media. So, so we're seeing uh, in the Australia Council a definite change in arts practice. Um, today's panel um, crosses both the arts as well as innovation and technolo te technology spheres. Um, firstly, and, and I want to, because we're going to be talking about the arts and technology, I want to bring a little bit of emotion into this. So, Gavin, Gavin Arts, our, our, our first panellist, is the Managing Director of, of Ancillary IPS. Um, he's worked on integrating innovation into strategy, uh, and he's worked across uh, numerous boards, as well as engaged in, in the sphere himself, in, te in the technology arts media space. So you'd call him a cross-pollinating, hybrid, hybridised sort of a guy. I'm really interested in his surname, which is A-R-T-Z, which is some kind of hybrid of art and something. You can talk to that, Gavin. Um, but I think it sort of describes Gavin well. I'll go across the panel and then we'll, we'll just... Um, I'll introduce you, uh, if you can start after that, Gavin. Um, Dr Marcus Hunter, to, to my left. When, when we hear Marcus talk, you are listening to the future. And I'm just going to leave it there. He, well, other than to say he's a professor of artificial intelligence at ANU, he's an author and a physicist, and he's got a very interesting theory on the future. Um, Martin Mackenzie Murray is a journalist and a speechwriter. Uh, Mart uh, Martin's style of journal journalism is 
em emblematic of the changes that we're seeing in journalism. He's a writer, a blogger, a speech writer. He, work he writes for the Fairfax Press. Uh, he, he writes for Crikey, he's in television. So we're in, in um, Martin's w world, we see that cross-media uh, hybridisation. And finally, Lucina Ward. Lucina Ward is a curator for international painting and sculpture at the National Gallery of Australia. Uh, herself a graduate from the Canberra School of Arts, she's curated many shows as a curator. And from Lucina, what we'll be hearing from someone who has the artist rather than the technology firmly at the centre of her thinking. So I think we're, got, we're going to have a hybrid panel talking about past, future and intersections. So um, the way we'll work is each panellist will talk for 10 minutes. I then want to see if we can get a bit of a robust discussion going within the panel itself uh, and throwing open to you guys. So Gavin, over to you. <coughs> yes, um, the, the name arts is actually a product of Australia's uh, multiculturalism. It's a real name from Holland, um, but it's actually Holland via Germany, so double multiculturalism. Uh, in many ways, I'll, I'll probably be following on from the, the international keynote uh, because uh, I've found my new calling. I am a wizard who has an MBA. <laughs> so I have both the humanities, um, the, the arts and the business side. What I'm going to be talking about today, if the slides come up, yes, fantastic, is, is really this idea, um, the, the problem with creativity. And this is probably a problem that you may not be aware of if perhaps you work in the arts, but you definitely feel the effects of it. But it's also a problem that you probably feel if you do any creative activity, um, be that science, uh, be that um, in any area of human endeavour. And the problem is not so much with the creativity itself, but the gap there is between the creativity or the, the deep explore, exploration that occurs in, in many of these creative activities and what is um, expected to be creativity in the rest of the world. And this gap is particularly apparent if you've ever been a creative person trying to uh, work in, in the business world. And if you're thinking about the problem of creativity in, in a, a more of a business situation, you're really talking about the idea of innovation. Now, we've heard the term innovation a fair bit today, and it's often used uh, poorly. It's often used um, very willy-nilly for, for many different things. But at the heart of it, the basic idea of innovation is the new idea or creativity and the application of that creativity. And if you think about it, that's a fantastic idea. All the great human thought in history and this idea is about how do you distribute it? How do you make that available to everyone? And often we talk about it in a commercial context but it's also very much an, an idea around culture and around one of the foundation, it's a foundation sort of idea about how we create civilization. How do we bring these new ideas, um, a lot of the pure research that we engage in and how do we distribute it amongst everyone? But if you're thinking about this in a, in a business context, you probably realise that there are some issues because the environments of, that really enhance creativity are not necessarily the environments that are really great for bringing something to market. And uh, the, the, the actual activity of creativity and when seen in a business context is seen as risk. It is seen as a very risky thing to engage in. And one of the problems is that when you're uh, in business and you're trying to reduce risk, you don't know whether that is a genius idea or the person is completely nuts. And that's a problem not so much for the... Well, ultimately it's a problem for the creative people in that they don't get to partake in, in, the, in some of this activity in society that builds wealth. But also, we as society tend not to benefit from, from these innovation processes because of this definition that has been applied to creativity in a business context. So when business talks about, in, about creativity, business is really talking about this idea of something that's a new idea, but something that's useful or immediately applicable. So for the most part of the really groundbreaking creativity that happens in society, um, the, the, things, the things that people engage in in the arts and pure research, 
in a business context, that's classified, well, it's not classified, but um, without, it's not classified as being useful. So I imagine it's classified as useless creativity. So we have this real problem that uh, when we're talking about innovation, the most uh, groundbreaking, the most insightful, the most deep thought that we have in society is deemed as useless and it's actually not used in the business context. And it's really important to, to be more uh, embracing of, of this useless creativity, <laughs> for want of a better, better word, because the people who engage in this do it for different reasons. They do it for the intellectual pursuit, the exploration, um, or the, the constant striving for something that they're not quite sure about. And in this process, they uncover new problems. And I think we focus very much in the mainstream of society around, around resolving known problems as opposed to discovering uh, unknown problems. And when we're talking about what will be needed in the future, we're really talking about people who explore and discover these unknown problems. And these, this is kind of important when we're building these new worlds because of the technology is, is moving quite quickly. So if you think about uh, building a robot, it's a technical problem, but living with one is a cultural problem. And I call this the uh, evil robot paradox because it sounds really cool to say that. <laughs> and the, the evil robot paradox is this idea that as technology becomes not so much a tool but an augmentation of us, then it has to have a deep cultural sympathy because we don't want to attach ourselves to technology, make it a part of us unless we can feel comfortable that it is a part of us. But it also means that perhaps we'll, we'll have to have similar human traits in our technology for us to be able to live with it, of predictable, um, predictable sort of idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic activity that comes from it. And maybe we might even have to sort of put up with some odd evil machine coming through if we're going to actually have a true cultural relationship with our technology. I wanted to talk also about how these ideas have shaped some, some work that's happening now in Adelaide around the development of the Fab Lab. Uh, Adelaide is the first uh, lab in Australia that's uh, an MIT affiliated Fab Lab. And the Fab Lab is a digital fabrication lab. And that's where we have a lot of machines that are maybe laser cutters or 3D printers, um, you know, sewing machines, anything that people can come in and, and create things with. And the idea is it's a, it's a bottom-up type of innovation where you have a lot of um, groups in the community, those perhaps who are involved in more the hacker space, sort of the, the geeks who, who, who hack up technology, but you have also a lot of arts and other creative people in society who, given the tools, will, will start developing and pursuing their own ideas. Now, just to give you an idea of why this is so interesting, from a manufacturing um, point of view, I'll just quickly go through the technology. So uh, these type of machines here are 3D printers, and these are ones that are probably affordable enough to have in your house, under $1,000, is that affordable? But anyway, uh, and these really rely on taking digital um, files and printing them out into solid objects. And this one melts plastic and it puts it down layer by layer. And really, it's, if you can, if you can um, design it on the computer, you can print it out. Also, the potential to get the data in, you can scan it um, with lasers. So you can scan objects and you can have it in the computer and you can print them out, or you can have them in the computer, you can man <coughs> manipulate them and print them out. So that also means that you have the same problems as you do with music and literature, where it's a digital file and people can share that everywhere. But also you have other benefits around that. So if you're an artist, you could produce um, beautiful artistic objects. But also, these objects may be um, outside of your uh, ability to afford in, in traditional processes to make. Also, it allows you to produce something and then look at it as a prototype and maybe improve upon it. Also, it's used in, in more design, like architecture, where you can turn your, uh, your CAD designs into 3D um, uh, actual uh, sort of marquettes that you can, you can look at. 
and it's used in rapid prototyping. And this is the shell of a car that was used um, in, a, in a sort of a, a technology lab where they're building an electric car and they needed to have uh, the external shell of a car. And it's also becoming more, more used in building. So this is, a, this is the plan for a two-storey building that's going to be printed in sandstone. So you start seeing the scale of this type of manufacturing coming through. It's also used in um, medicine um, a fair bit, actually, in dentistry for quite some time. Um, some of your dentists may actually have these machines in their offices now. And here we have a jaw, which is out of titanium. Also have a prosthetic limb, and there's an MIT fab lab in Afghanistan, and they can custom make, um, unfortunately, there's a demand for um, uh, prosthetic legs, and they can custom make it with very simple scanners that where they can scan uh, the person's uh, leg and then custom, custom make these legs. And also prosthetics in, turn of, in, in, in terms of uh, more internal organs such as, um, uh, such as uh, arteries in this case. But also it's moving through to being able to print human organs, so tissue, and not far off now being able to print human organs. And more recently uh, there's also been a project around printing meat. So we're really looking at a future of manufacturing that is much more driven by arts, design and craft. And the reason why we have this in South Australia particularly is that the South Australian, well, uh, uh, defeased in, the, in South Australia, part of the government, recognise that the future of manufacturing is actually going to be much more driven by, by, by design and by, by the arts. We also, uh, in the high end, you have something like this, which is nearly a $900,000 machine, which is a laser sintering machine. And companies like General Electric use this to print out high-end aerospace parts. So once again, you can see the breadth of the future of manufacturing that's going to be much more driven by creative processes, much more dri driven by design. But it's also going to be much more driven by those communities and those networks. So the networks, for instance, of the Fab Lab and, and then networks through to TAFE. It's housed in AC Arts um, for the time being, which is a, 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 an arts facility with TAFE. And then also perhaps um, just the general community coming in, but then attached to other, other, other networks such as entrepreneurship courses. And this is really providing a bottom-up innovation process and, in effect, changing how we see the economy from a large investment, top-down type of approach to more of a creative community approach uh, to building an economy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Gavin. I love the evil robot paradox. <laughs> um, it, it, I'd be interested in... Um, the Canberra Grammar view of the who's the evil robot in, in your organisation. Um, so over to uh, Dr. Marcus Hunter. Marcus. Okay, see ya. Um, so um, that was a good start. Um. <laughs> There's no competition on this panel. <laughs> no, no. For the future, so I will talk about the far distant future or potential future, or maybe it's not too far distant. So the younger generation here may live in it, yeah, so we have to see. And if you think that's all science fiction, you know, then it's fine, so hopefully you enjoy it nevertheless. But I try to present some arguments why this may become real. Okay. Um, so first, what is the technological singularity? Um, it's a hypothetical scenario in which self-accelerating technological advances cause infinite progress in finite time. Um, usually it's associated with computer speed getting higher and higher, yeah, and not just doubling, but getting infinitely large in finite time, often correlated with intelligent systems getting more and more intelligent. Okay. And um, then this is usually associated with a prediction barrier. So think about a caveman trying to understand our current society so maybe we will not be able, so the current humans, not be able to understand this future society. And that's the reason why it's called singularity. It's borrowed from black hole singularity um, terminology. Okay, um, so the idea is actually not very new. So there are some ancient references hundred, over 150 years ago. But um, then um, in the last century, so mid of the 20th century, Several, interestingly, all mathematicians yeah. um, came up with this idea or discussed this idea. 
Um, and maybe the most popular one is Werner Wünsch, who wrote some science fiction and also about that. But it really got popularized by Ray Kurzweil, so Ray Kurzweil is an inventor, um, uh, in two books in 1999 and then in 2005, and then of course the internet. And since then, there have been several events, often annual events. Um, there's a Singularity Summit, one international one, and one national one actually in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, so the Australians once caught up quite quickly with this. And um, several organizations, and meanwhile, serious philosophers um, who discuss these scenarios, and several others. Okay, and um, there are also many related developments. So there's something called artificial general intelligence. It's a community who tries to build machines which have the capacity of human intellect. Um, there are whole brain emulations. There's a project like uh, called Blue Brain in Switzerland. They're trying to simulate a whole human brain. Um, meanwhile, we have a mathematical theory of intelligence and um, actually super intelligence, which you can study theoretically. Um, um, immortalism has been revived. Um, there are million dollar prices um, for extending mouse lifespan and um, the ultimate goal is to extend human lifespan. Uh, there's a lot of interest in this, obviously. Um, there's a, a movement called transhumanism, uh, which Gavin hinted at already. Uh, where we humans modify ourselves. So I just give one example, implanting chips to be able to say connect to the internet always without having to type and to look. Um, there are even some movements which have a religious connotation like the omega point theory where the universe evolves towards something which has maximum level of complexity or consciousness. So they're all somewhat related to this technological singularity scenario. And so how could this singularity come? Um, there are various scenarios. One is um, we scan our human brain, upload it to a computer and simulate it there, and then it can get enhanced. Yeah, that is one scenario. Um, the other one is the traditional good old fashioned AI approach, which just program computers to become smart. Um, or you take the machine learning approach where you build, say, an intelligent artificial baby and then which learns by experience, which seems to be simpler than building an adult. Um, or you go even further back and you just simulate evolution yeah, artificially. That's called genetic algorithms or the artificial life approach. Okay. Uh, and the last scenario I want to present um, is the awakening of the internet. I mean, now we have, I think, two billion computers connected to the internet and we have all kinds of tools and intelligent um, algorithms running there. And, you know, maybe at some point it awakes and becomes intelligent. Um, so that's the digital Gaia scenario. Okay, so um, here's Moore's law. I hope you have seen that before. So it's an empirical observation that um, for over 50 years or maybe 100 years, you can extrapolate it back. Computing speed doubles every two years or 1.5 years. Okay. And if you extrapolate that to the future and you take some estimates of the capacity of a human brain, then in 30 years, your mobile phone will have higher capacity than your own brain. And maybe we also have the software then in 30 years. Okay, maybe not, who knows, yeah. And then wait a couple of more decades, and then your mobile phone um, will um, exceed the capacity of the whole human race, uh, intellectually. Okay, that's a bold extrapolation, um, but it's not too implausible, at least for the computing speed and memory concerns. Whether we have the software or not is another question. Okay. So if you think that is pretty fast, uh, maybe it gets even faster. So, so why does it double every two years? It's not a natural law. It's because we do research and development and engineering and these innovation cycles, they take <coughs> two years, interestingly, rather constantly. But once the machines are smart enough and they can do the innovation, they can do it more quickly. They may be able to do it in one year, and then they're so quick they do it in half a year, and then a quarter of a year. And if you remember from high school, one plus one half plus one quarter, and so on, add up to a finite number. So in finite time, you will have infinite progress. Okay. So here's maybe something which is less abstract or more familiar. Um, so millions of years ago, we had a hunter-gathering area where the population doubled every 250,000 years. 
Um, so the economy doubled every 250,000 years. But then with agricultural economy um, and farming, the agricultural um, economy grew every 900 years, an enormous speed up. And then 200 years ago, we had the industrial revolution. And since then, economy doubles every 15 years. I mean, every 15 years, that's pretty crazy. Yeah? Uh, but maybe that's not the end of the story. Information technology becomes more and more important to our society. And maybe it becomes the dominant part. And since computing speed doubles, and if information technology dominates economy, then maybe the whole economy doubles every two years. And then there's some economists, like Robin Hansen, who believe, you know, that's not enough, you know, maybe it can double every month, yeah, or weekly. Yeah. Doesn't look very sustainable, yeah, so some alarm bells should ring here. Um, okay, so, okay, that's a potential scenario, but of course there are many obstacles. There are structural obstacles, um, so maybe, you know, all this computing speed, that doesn't help us, there's some, um, it, it flattens out, yeah. Um, or manifestation obstacles. Maybe we destroy ourselves or maybe an asteroid destroys ourselves before that happens. Um, and there are of course physical limitations, but let me ensure you they are so far removed so they are not a problem, these physical limitations. Then there are of course engineering difficulties, but the engineers have been pretty good in the last 50 and 100 years to overcome them and why not the next 50 years. Um, personally I believe maybe the most likely defeat of a singularity is this inclination, so maybe we don't want to build that or have that. Although the young generation really likes their computers, their simulators, their virtual worlds, so I don't see any trend in this direction. Okay, what does it mean for the future of humanity? Well, I guess there are two basic choices. Either you participate or you're, you don't. Yeah? And if you participate, then you will become a transhuman, you get transformed, and it's an interesting question then how much of humanity as we understand it now is left over and how great is the change. Yeah? Or you stay behind um, and get marginalized and possibly extinct. So I guess these are the two major options. And of course, you know, if this scenario comes, then this has enormous implications. So all the other considerations you we have heard here before, I mean, they get really dwarfed by this. You know, it has ethical, political, economical, medical, cultural, humanitarian, religious implications and, and not small ones. Um, one important one is, uh, I just pick one. Yeah? Um, if it becomes very easy to copy life, yeah? or in general, if something becomes easy to copy, then the value goes usually down. Yeah? So if it becomes easy to copy life, then maybe the value of life goes down. So maybe it, it even becomes a disposable. Nobody cares about it anymore, even yourself about your own life. It sounds, you know, odd, but it's, you know, it's interesting to think about this. Um, well, you potentially can, be, can become immortal, and immortality also has great consequences, and I don't mean overpopulation of the planet, I mean, it has implications about your motivation. If you have you know, an infinite life in front of you, you know, why don't take 10 years of vacation? Yeah? I mean, you don't have to catch up, right? It has a lot of implications and you, the values will change. And I think I will stop here. Um, there are of course alternative societies. I've indicated it in the last line, but I don't have time to get into that. Um, you can ask me questions about that later. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus. Um, Thank you, that was great. It's nice for us to be left pondering on the value of, of, a, of a human life. Um, okay, so um, over to Martin. Um, I'll just give you a quick preface uh, to try to affix this speech, which is very different, to the theme of the future, uh, so it doesn't seem aloof or kind of floating independently from what you've heard. Um, what we've heard is a lot about change. I guess I'm going to talk about uh, literature, journalism, speech writing, and talk about what is unchanging about those things. A couple of years ago, I attended a Robert McKee seminar on comic screenwriting. Now, if you haven't heard of Robert McKee, he's a profane, gruff guru of scriptwriting. 
who, perversely for his critics, has never had a screenplay produced. McKee attracts the inexperienced and desperate, that was the category I fell into, as well as celebrities. David Bowie, Julia Roberts, Kirk Douglas, Joan Rivers, to name just a few, have all taken his course. In fact, in the seminar I took, Jeffrey Rush was sitting just in front of me. John Cleese has taken his course at least three times. McKee considers him a friend. In fact, Cleese's great film, A Fish Called Wanda, was shown in its entirety in the seminar I took and was dissembled by McKee afterwards. And it's John Cleese I want to talk about. However unlikely that might seem, John Cleese gives me our springboard for this talk. And stay with me. At the time of the seminar, I was working here in Canberra as a speechwriter. I would work in our capital for three years, mostly as a speechwriter, later as a communications advisor, adding to the year I'd previously spent writing for the then West Australian Premier, Alan Carpenter. My work in Western Australia was political. My work here was largely departmental. At that point, I had long abandoned my West Wing pretensions of serving in some Australian Camelot. I was jaded, emotionally scorched, and desperately trying to transpose my bottomless contempt for middle managers into a pilot for a political sitcom. I thought if I could put my dread, my disgust, my doom-heavy leadenness in the service of comedy, then I might be able to hold off the dogs of existential despair. Every day was an awful confirmation of George Orwell's fabled essay, Politics and the English Language. In it, Orwell writes, prose consists less and less of words chosen for the sake of their meaning and more and more of phrases tacked together like the sections of a prefabricated hen house. When a culture of timidity accommodates the inadequate and inarticulate, a very powerful storm of jargon breaks out. Given that good writing is predicated on clear thinking, a culture swamped by jargon begs the question, how well are we thinking? Colleagues were thinking in the babble of corporate speak. Their cognition, or at least the clarity of their thought, was harmed by it. In addition to Orwell, the journalist Joan Didion came to mind. In her 1967 essay, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, Didion turned her stern eye to the drug-addled dropouts of San Francisco. She wrote, They feed back exactly what is given them, because they do not believe in words and a thought which needs words is just one more of those ego trips. Their only proficient vocabulary is in society's platitudes. As it happens, I am still committed to the idea that the ability to think for oneself depends upon one's mastery of language. The same casual idiocy, the subconscious contempt of language is alive and well within communications teams throughout our government departments. So anyway, here I am in McKee's seminar. I'm in Melbourne, but I've taken Canberra with me. I'm angry. <laughs> and it happens. Sublime vindication. An appreciation of language I still possess, and I have John Cleese to thank. Great comic writing, McKee said, is written from a point of disturbance. Take Cleese, he says. Cleese has been in therapy for years. Why? Because John Cleese detests being English. He has a hatred of Englishness. McKee went on, Cleese writes from that point of disturbance, from his fear and loathing of English reticence, reticence and rectitude, its pathological fear of embarrassment, its belief that the worst social crime is earnestness. Now, you might disagree with Cleese's diagnosis of the English character, but either way, it's gifted certain therapists many thousands of dollars over the years. And here's the other thing. McKee thinks, and I'm paraphrasing, that Cleese's funniest, most cherished writing springs from his belief that England is one large and vulgar neurosis. Cleese writes from this disturbance. And here's what I thought and still think and implore you to consider. That if this is true, and not just true for Cleese or comedy, but true for great works of art constituted by language, then you must also consider this as a triumphant and awe-inspiring trapeze act. Disturbances, trauma, anger, indignation, depression, have a cruel way of making its owner narcissistic. I can unhappily speak from experience, and I'm sure most of you can too. For a writer to mind this, to be motivated by loathing, for instance, or indignation, is risky. The work, not to mention your social relationships, can very quickly collapse under the ugly weight of righteousness, repetition, and self-absorption. If we are disturbed, we aren't often graceful. 
So imagine writing from this point, writing something that's both inspired and threatened by your demons. Pause on that. Consider the delicacy of that internal negotiation. How to write something that speaks to strangers, that is universally or as close to that ideal as you can come, funny or interesting or poignant or true. That goal to move or exhilarate strangers is surely threatened by the disturbance that sponsored it in the first place. And so I think it's a triumph that our culture is touched by great works inspired by disturbance. It's a triumph that we are capable of dangerously mining our trauma to create work that is elegant and funny and charming and instructive. That's a jaw-dropping act of deafness and discipline. My disturbance was indignation, a sense that my skills were being powerfully and systematically ignored, and I battled the sickly snobbery and righteousness that this cultivated. But amongst that, I learned that it was okay to be disturbed, provided I had the balance and self-awareness to create rather than destroy with it. And finally, no, I haven't finished my script. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Martin. I think the combination of Marcus followed by Martin is, you know, quite fascinating. We have some for someone for whom um, the, the, your sense of dis disturbance and emotion and is quintessentially human. For for Marcus, your world, I question whether human is, and we'll go there in a minute. But your your great bookends to a conversation. Um, so now to Lucina. all that technology. Well, thank you, Cass. This has been a really terrific and um, quite inspiringly diverse uh, day already. Uh, so I hope that our final pa panel can um, continue with that. Um, I'm going to focus on one particular work by uh, the artist, American artist James Terrell, which is a recent commission um, at the National Gallery of Australia. Um, and American artist, in, in this work, and some of the points I'll make uh, more broadly, um, the fundamental thing I find it really important about his work is the way in which he works with light and perception. And all, the way in which all of his environments um, enhance the senses and affect the way that we feel, but also the way we specifically feel. All of his projections and light and installations cause the vis viewer to experience light in different ways. And this I think he's doing because he wants to encourage us to think, to ask questions about the source and origins of light for all sorts of different reasons. Now, most of us are fairly conscious that most of the time the sky is above us. And most of us take for granted that we'll stay there. But we're, when we're in a sky space, Tyrell makes us perceive differently. The light appears more painterly. Movement and colour are much more intense. The light sometimes seems to form a ball which floats above us. And at times, the, spa the, the, the sky even seems to enter into the space. Now, the Canberra sky space is approached via a long sloped uh, walkway. And once you're inside the mound, you find yourself in a large square-based pyramid. The interior walls are richly coloured with an ochre pigment. pigment pardon me. There's water, and at the centre of the turquoise pond, this huge black granite stupa. Two ramps set at right angles around the perimeter of the pyramid converge on a single entrance on the opposite side of the stupa. And by following one of those ramps around, the visitor crosses the water and enters the sky space proper. Now, sky spaces are a leading uh, motif in Tyrell's work, and each retains the same basic structure. It's, it really is a viewing chamber without a roof. But they vary in format, materials, and their unique sites. In New York, for example, at PS1, Terrell has formed a sky space by cutting an aperture in the roof of a decommissioned uh, school building. For a private client in Beverly Hills, he incorporated a padded, padded floor mat, a cocktail bar, and a window that looks out onto the skyline of Los Angeles. In Germany, at the Center for, the, uh, Center for Light in Una, 
Tyrell has designed a two-level sky space, which incorporates a camera obscura. And us using that camera obscura, the images are collected, are transmitted via a lens onto the space below. Now, even if you don't know the, the artist's work, you may be familiar with his best known life work, which is the Roden Crater in Arizona, where in an instinct volcano on the western edge of the painted desert near the Great Canyon, he's building a naked eye observatory. There's a series of underground tunnels, chambers, viewing portals, where you can observe specially calculated views of the sky and the moon, as well as rare astronomical events. He says, at the Roden Crater, I was interested in taking the cultural artifice of art out into the natural surround. I did not want the work to be a mark upon nature, but I wanted the work to be enfolded in nature in such a way that light from the sun, moon and stars empowers the spaces. I wanted an area where you had a sense of standing on the planet. I want an area of exposed geology, where you could feel geologic time. In this stage set of geologic logic time, I make spaces that engage celestial events and lights, so the spaces performed a music of the sphere in light. So uh, Tyrell's magnum opus at the Roden Crater is in effect the preparation for and culmination of all of the works that he uh, executes elsewhere. He conceived the Roden Crater as a place to gather light, light which is older than our solar system. In 1997, he persuaded the local uh, uh, county to pass a dark sky ordinance. So that this means that the commercial and domestic lighting uh, within Flagstaff, the closest town, is kept low. It, it has no effect on your ability to get around. It just means that it's fantastic for viewing the sky. Now, the artist's work comes out of perceptual psychology, his study of mathematics and art, art and history. And he talks about his early interest in light becoming fused with the psychology of perception and his distrust of the color wheel. He says, if you take blue paint and yellow paint and you mix them, you get green paint. But if you take blue light and yellow light and mix them, you get white light. This is a shock to most pe people. Uh, Tyrell's raised <coughs> as a Quaker and fondly remembers his grandmother explaining what to do at meetings. When you're in a meeting house, or the Quaker meeting house, she told him to go inside and greet the light. But he's got a fascinating background, not only um, as a Quaker, but as a pilot and an aircraft mechanic. And he later uses these skills to finance his art projects. It's a very complex and, and fascinating uh, political uh, background too, in that as a conscientious objector, he flew secret missions throughout Southeast Asia, ferrying Tibetan refugees to uh, safety. And in those time, often finding flying blind, he became finely attuned to the connections between the earth and the heavens. This is also where his familiarity with Southeast Asian architecture comes from. So flying, in a small aircraft is very important for Tutorel and his working methods. He describes the aeroplane as his studio, an extension of his body. He found the Roden crater by flying for several months, but it actually took him several years to persuade the rancher to sell the, 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 the crater to him. His other works, his early works, used uh, flame, and then he began to uh, construct light projections that formed geometric shapes in existing spaces. He's also made a whole series of works that expose the visitor to total darkness. So once you're inside the Canberra sky space, you find yourself within a simple whitewashed circular and roofless space. It's very sparsely furnished. It's got a concrete bench around the edge. There's a bank of lights that are, are, are located at the base of the dome, discreetly fixed into the wall. And you'll notice, of course, that this inner sanctum is a very Spartan space. It's the aesthetic, almost church-like in presentation. Now, as the slides I've put up suggest, the entire structure of within, the wa within without is partly subterranean. This reduces the light pollution and serves to muffle extraneous sound from outside. But the, the business of sound is also very important within the work itself. The water, which constantly cascades, creates a white noise and promotes a sense of contemplation within the space. 
And it's also important that when you're within the space, when you stand at the centre of the space, there's some fascinating or oral effects. You can also whisper around the wall. But it's, it's time that's probably most important for this, for this work. And um, uh, some slides to suggest the effect of the dawn and dusk cycle uh, that happen as obviously at dawn and dusk each time. Now, each day. The, light, um, the changing light conditions and variations in the season mean that the work is always different. But it is at dawn and dusk that, um, of course, the transition between night and day that the work is at its most uh, dramatic. Now, the artist um, uh, mixes light for the, uh, for the dawn and dusk cycles uh, very much as you would mix uh, 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 sound. This uh, work uses an LED lighting system, but it also has very complex compression and expansion programs to ensure that that dawn and dusk move so that the duration of the dawn lengthens and shortens with the days. In the winter solstice, the cycle's approximately 20 minutes, and in the summer, it lasts as long as an hour. So the image of, this, of the sky space, of the construction of the sky space put up, is a bit like me analysing the mechanics of human anatomy and deciding that this helps understand what makes us human. It's related, of course, but it's not the only thing. This is an art that is emphatically physical and yet has nothing to touch. It relies on a certain investment of time and what, more importantly, what the viewer brings to the work. It's a slow building kind of art, but as Terrell points out, things that are closer to the sublime often have a different time frame. Now, what you bring to the space is, of course, part of the unknown. Um, whether you come solo, when you come as part of a group, is one variable in the experience. Your perceptions also change the longer you stay with the work. If you stay for a, a dusk cycle, um, you, you have one sort of experience. Dawn is quite different. The repeat visits, of course, enhance and develop some of these fascinating possibilities that the artist sets up for us. Terrell is a very knowledgeable uh, uh, artist, has an amazing uh, background and interest in uh, different fields. And he's, uh, but what I like and what I'll finish with is a point that he made when asked about the parallels between art and science. He said, I always felt that art was more interested in posing the question than it was in getting the answer. But recently, I've just come to decide that art is actually the answer. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Lucina. So we've just had four very, very different perspectives on humanness. Uh, in fact, playing out the fact how human this panel is, that they've responded to that topic in such a diverse way. Um, we will throw open to you in a second, but I'll, I'll just start off by um, uh, starting the thread with Marcus and asking the panellists to, to throw in. Um, do, my, my first question to Marcus over the telephone was as follows. Marcus, do you believe in this future that you're presenting? I should repeat my answer. Yes. Uh, that was private, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Um, I believe that there's some realistic chance that this will happen. So I think there's no categorical argument which rules this out. And it could even happen in the next couple of decades, or at least this century. So um, I think that's a phenomenon which is um, large enough and probable enough to take seriously. Right, just get that straight. And now, um, is, are there, do you see a world and are you comfortable with it where there are no humans? Or do, it does, does your world play itself out to, to a point where humans are no longer exi exist? Um, I think I want to refrain from this answer. <laughs> I, um, I've tried to project a future which I think is plausible or not implausible. And since it has enormous consequences, um, it should be explored, or at least it's interesting to explore. And I think whether I like it or not is, is really irrelevant. It's a question whether the majority or even minorities of 
our population likes it or not, and then makes a decision. And you know, I I cannot tell. I can only I only know that the young generation they have no problems with the technology, with their mobile phones, with spending hours in virtual worlds. Yeah, and if they could, they probably would spend their whole life there. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe at some point it's also enough for them. I don't know. Um, it's usually the older generations who are more skeptical and would prefer to preserve the state of the art rather than having too much of a change. Um, and, and so the, the, to just take that further, uh, I'd ask the panelists to comment on the role of the individual or in, in the, the, the different scenarios that have been put, um, put forward today. Uh, yeah, just, just following on. Um, also, we, we tend to think, we, we tend to be very definite <coughs> about what it is to be human. And then um, for somebody who, who can't remember numbers at all and, and for endlessly taken to task through school for this obviously huge character flaw, um, uh, we find that now that we carry our computers everywhere and they're in extensions of us, that pretty much all of us are offloading that to, to somewhere else. Uh, was that a, a defining thing of being human? Well, probably not. Uh, or have we just happily adapted to this? And I'm finding it with the internet. Um, I'm, I'm finding the barrier between me seeking information and the information being available and the community of people who are supplying that information is, is becoming less and less. Yes, I'm still an individual, but really we tend to think of ourselves as humans, as individuals, where we're kind of much more like ants. <laughs> We, we have our individual participation, but the actual whole is probably more human than, than perhaps the individual needs to be, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you. Um, I confess to technological singularity um, and uh, automation is beyond my competence, but uh, to speak about arguably the things that remain stable, um, at core human. Um, I guess I was touching on storytelling and I can't see you know, the rapidity of technological advancement removing that essential need to tell stories. Um, I picked up Salman Rushdie's memoir this morning which has just come out and he echoed what Joan Didion once said which is we tell ourselves stories in order to live. Salman Rushdie says uh, we're the only animal to tell stories in order to understand ourselves. Um, I can't see that changing and there's a, there's I'll call it a beautiful fallacy that we're more autonomous than we, we are. I think we're prisoners to brain chemistry, we're prisoners to our past, but there's a fierce, stubborn reluctance to accept anything that might eclipse the fallacy of our um, being individual. And whilst it might be false, I think there's something charming in our reluctance to accept anything that might eclipse that autonomy. Um, and, and the other thing is, regardless of how the future plays out, I think we'll continue to tell stories. Um, in order to live, as Didion said. Now, I think I'm, does this one work? I think I'm right in th thinking that the other thing that is particular to humans is that um, apart from some fact of cows getting into um, marijuana plantations and falling over, uh, I think humans are some of the only that like to experiment with their brains, experiment with perception. And I think that's something that, uh, for me, um, the Sky Space does, and what I find so fascinating about James Terrell's work is this experimentation with this manipulation of uh, perception, the way in which you feel. I skipped over something I was going to mention, which uh, is that some of uh, Terrell's work, that what he calls perceptual cells, which are shaped a little bit like an RMI, MRI machine and that you get slid into that fiddle with your brain waves. Um, and these are works of art that I find quite extraordinary because one of the reasons that he explains that he does this is because it's a fascinating experience. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that it, um, you know, it, it intrigues me about his work and that what I find fascinating about humans is his willingness to fiddle with perception. Um, 
a, a slight tangent, but a quick question. Has anyone uh, seen the work that Lucina's talking about? The, has anyone seen Terrell's work? No. Um, you actually reminded me, it reminds me of, um, has anyone seen the uh, Holocaust Memorial in Berlin? It's a, it, it has to be one of the most emotional, um, um, at least simple, uh, tri um, it's, it's really a, it's a, it's a room with a, with a, a, a circle cut into yeah. the, to yeah. the ceiling. It's, open, it's open to the elements all year. And so it builds up with snow and it goes. And it's just this incredibly simple um, moment out of your day to sit and look at, this, at, at, the, at the sky and think. Um, it's really quite amazing. Um, and I, I think, Lucinda, you, you, the human in what, in what you're talking about is both the artist and the audience. And I think the power of art in transforming audiences is, is really quite, quite extraordinary. Um, I'm really interested to hear questions and particularly, come on lads, give us a go. What, tell, what, what in the, particularly in the future or in response to, to an artist um, has touched a nerve for you yeah, here at the front? Uh, when, when you particularly talk about nanotechnology, there's the, um, there's the grey goo that they talk about, which is, which is also part of this concept of singularity, where if, you, uh, if artificial intelligence take over and artificial intelligence create other artificial intelligence, and kind of a self-defining self in a way, and be able to produce uh, nano particles that can go around and act autonomously and do their own things, then there's a potential for all matter just to become sort of this grey, grey goo because this stuff just happens at a molecular level. So yes, there's always potential for an apocalypse, and it makes makes for great filmmaking, I suppose. Uh, but and perhaps that's that's the interesting thing uh, uh, about being human as well is is you know, there's been a lot of mass extinctions on the planet, and the planet doesn't particularly care if we're here. Uh, but humans care if we're here, and perhaps how we go about um, having these discussions around science and technology and its relationship to humans is is what prevents that type of scenario from happening. And Marcus, yeah. And then I can see the question here yeah. and here. Just, yeah, just for, for one brief add-on. Um, so there's a lot of discussion about risks, yeah, and um, and a lot of money spent on say medium or large risks like, you know, million of deaths because of flooding or something like that, yeah? Um, there's much too little discussion about real catastrophic risks wiping out the human race. And there, there's a great book by Cambridge philosopher Nick Bostrom. Um, it's called Global Catastrophic Risks. And he lists about 15 or so global risks which really wipe out humanity. And um, so 15 forms of apocalypse, yeah? And we should take them most of them seriously and uh, try to do something about them as far as we are able to. Right, thanks. Um, question just over here. Yeah. How do I know that you are conscious? <laughs> so, um, so actually, I think that the world-renowned, most renowned philosopher here, also in Canberra, David Chalmers, um, who can tell you everything about consciousness. Um, I'm not an expert in that, but um, I believe that if we interact with machines yeah, and they behave like they are conscious, most of us will then ascribe to them that they are conscious. Whether they are really are or not, we will probably never know. Yeah? I mean, philosophy is called zombies. Yeah? Um, but as I said, I don't know whether you are a zombie or uh, <laughs> conscious, and, but it's just polite um, <laughs> to um, <laughs> ascribe you consciousness. Thanks. Um, question over here. Uh, to, to my knowledge, it's, it's not um, being uh, pursued in Australia. Um, a lot of this, I think a lot of the, particularly the building, um, if you're talking about building buildings, 
Uh, that's, that's occurring a lot in England and Europe at the moment. Uh, there's, there's different levels of it. There's, there's from you know, actually printing in sandstone through to more on-site um, fabrication of, of panels that then go through. So there's, there's, a lot of, there's a range of things happening in that space, uh, but it's really only perhaps been the last one year, one and a half years that that's really taken off. But when you look at this technology, uh, a machine that may have cost $50,000 last year, at the start of the year, halfway through the year was $10,000 and next year they'll be l releasing them for a couple of thousand dollars. So the, the amount of uh, effort going into creating these machines and the cost of these machines and availability uh, is, is becoming uh, dramatically cheaper, dramatically more impressive what they can do and I'm sort of, you sort of really need to be thinking about um, that this is going to be a, a part of the, of the building industry in probably the next five years. Uh, question at the back there. Yeah, Yeah, and I, I don't think anybody's put a lot of... It's great to talk about the technology, but nobody's really thought about the, both the cultural impact and the economic impact of this. Um, one, one big aspect of it is we act, we're so used to mass production and the requirement of having large investment and centralised production. We don't know what it means to be able to produce things that we want. Um, we're so used to going to a shop and there's a hundred of the same thing. We go, close enough. We don't actually know what it means or what it means to empower a, a, a citizen or a community to be able to start creating objects at different scales, exactly how they want it. And what does that mean to participate as, as a citizen in society? And then also, what does it mean for the economy when you can have, uh, you, you completely tip it on its head. You don't need large investment. What the skills you require, as you quite rightly pointed out, it's not some of these more process-oriented skills or managerial skills or even some of these more engineering skills in many ways, although engineering is quite important still. It's much more... The skills that we're seeing coming through are much more design-orientated. Actually, some of the traditional craft skills are very transposable into this type of manufacturing. And I think that also goes to the singularity in, in a sense that a lot of this open source way of working has meant that everyone has access to it. You have community science where people are setting up uh, science labs in their community because the information is available online, the equipment's available online, it's cheap, and people can start doing things that they want to do. And you have this explosion, particularly in the 3D printers and that sort of cheap end, of people just going, well, I can make these printers and share them with my friends. Um, okay, we'll move on. I think Hush here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, going back to your Josh Langman days in Best Spring, yeah. uh, in that life of yours, uh, and because you're the only one here who's sort of being inside the bubble, so to say, what do you think politicians in Australia and specifically probably in general need to do to change, to adapt, to understand to all of these things that are happening? Because they seem to be most interested in tomorrow and opening the doors tomorrow and we debate in tomorrow's newspaper. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just repeat the question. If I understand you speaking about like a structural short-sightedness of, of politicians? Yes. How will, how will they change to react to all of this and to be part of this or not be part of this? Okay, and, and, and participate in a more substantive yes. dialogue rather than, yes. sure. Um, it's, it's a good question. Let me, let me answer it by... The, Lindsay Tanner, former um, finance minister, released a book last year called Sideshow. Um, where he posited that 
It was the media's kind of insatiable appetite for the salacious, the insubstantial, um, and politicians had sort of cowed in response. Um, they'd become more willing to participate in the sideshow of the media, which was endless kind of 24-7, um, an addiction to polling, et cetera. My feeling is that in our polity, there are three agents. There are voters, politicians, and the media. And to single one out um, at the expense of focusing on the others is a little simplistic. I think we're entangled. There's an entanglement between those three um, agents, if you like, um, which means that we will quite happily entertain fallacies, whether they be about taxation, climate change, etc. There, there are many things where there's a considerable cognitive dissonance amongst voters. There's also a considerable reluctance to speak uh, to voters as adults. Uh, and then you have, you know, one of the... It hasn't been unadulterated goodness, this technological advancement for the media. It's, it's given us a lot of good things, but one of the poor things is 24-7 news, where it just becomes uh, an endless kind of ticker tape scroll of rubbish. Um, and I, I don't know if this is becoming too tangential if it's answering your question, but um, I mentioned a few weeks ago on a panel that uh, in light of most of our columns, most of our writing is this kind of quite aggressive, aggressively shallow uh, prediction of what might happen next week. It's less about policy and more about the Machiavellian kind of maneuvers, which are actually quite banal in my experience. They're not terribly interesting, but we kind of now as a a guy in the media, I can see how the temptation to kind of beat these things into a lather, these kind of this political intrigue, and you don't get any substance there. Um, and I think one of the ways we kind of fill that space um, created by this amnesia of the 24-7 news cycle, where we forget kind of what went last week, because we're too busy looking at the new polling, uh, the latest fracas, the latest kind of confected controversy, we fill that space with polls. That's the thing that gives us meaning, that we can hold on to. If the journalist's job is to rest order from a very chaotic environment, and our politics is aggressively chaotic, that poll kind of fills that space, but it's vacuous, because it, when, you, when you give all your attention to it, as the politicians I work for often did, not always, uh, you forgo deeper conversations. What happens if the mining boom goes, you know, what's, these conversations about our future, for instance, I don't, that doesn't really answer your question, um, but I... I think it's a little too neat to focus just on the media. The media is morally bankrupt, or politicians are all cowardly. There's an entanglement. Um, and I'll leave it at that, I guess. I hope that partially answers your question. Uh, thank you. Let me see if anyone else wants to pick up on that. There's, sorry, there's a question in the middle here. Yeah. So your comment or question is about whether the whether computers now already are more intelligent than humans. Um, <laughs> uh, well, in parts they are better than we are. I mean, they can multiply billions of numbers in a second, and we, we can't do that. Uh, the knowledge base is is huge, um, much more than a single human can store. Um, but still, humans have a lot of capacities um, which humans are not able to. I mean, it was just 15 years ago that. Um, the best chess player is a computer, Deep Blue, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so, so we are not on top of this anymore. But there are many, many other skills, especially doing research and development, um, where, where computers cannot compete with us. Um, they, 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 they are starting to do some research, yeah, but it's, uh, it's on, a, on a very, very low level. Um, I mean, even driving a car, that just became in the last few years Possible. So now they're autonomous cars, and they changed the legislation in, I think, California now that they should be allowed to drive on a street because they're good enough. Yeah. So, and I mean, driving a car is not a particularly high intellectual capacity, and computers just pass this threshold. Speech recognition is something which humans can still do much better than computers, but we are getting very close. So in five years, probably we are on par. Computer vision. Recognizing objects is horrible compared to humans. Yeah? It's these capacities which we once thought um, are highly 
um, intellectual, like playing chess or multiplying large numbers where computers beat us. But in these more um, natural capacities like vision, natural language processing, dealing with the real world, um, we are still superior to computers. Um, I'm mindful of time, so So I didn't get the question. Uh, does that then not move from intelligence capability as opposed to from knowledge and capability? Yeah, I, I mean, intelligence is much more than knowledge. Uh, and, and for me, the knowledge part is actually, I mean, as a mathematician, I mean, yes, you need to know something, but the real um, creative and intelligence part is to do something with it. And the knowledge I can look up, yeah, um, definitely intelligence is more than just a huge amount of knowledge. And um, you have to assess and measure that properly if you want to quantitatively talk about which system is more intelligent than another. And that's a very difficult subject. Um, but um, in recent years, um, we and others have developed mathematical tools in order to measure real, in quotation mark, um, intelligence rather than just knowledge, for instance. Right. And last comment. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's happening a lot, too, in terms of automation. Uh, we're very used to robotics as automation, but there's a real algorithm-based automation where a lot of what we thought were professional jobs are starting to be taken up by that. And we're, we're seeing this idea of creativity not being this uh, resolving known problems, but this, this, this idea or this intelligence being where we, um, we, f we find or we resolve sort of unknown problems or problems that have big chunks missing out of them. And so I, I think in terms of intelligence, there's still that gap between what drives the human brain and we still need to drive the computer brain, but the potential for that to shift is there as well. Um, look, thank you very much for a very engaged conversation. So in summary, we have covered evil robots, singularity, transhumans, augmentation, light and perception, the power of the artist, 15 apocalypses, politics, disturbance, d zombies, and of course, John Cleese. So could you please join me in thanking our panellists for a really engaged conversation. Well, thanks to Rose and the panel. I think the description of that uh, session was thought-provoking. <laughs> um, I'm not sure who's provoking what or whatever, but the thought is there. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, an excellent day. Thank you very much for coming.